Hello everybody, Brett Ballin here. Um, I'm making this video in lieu of uh, a potential uh, scheduling conflict with the um, eRes final project presentations on December the 5th. Uh, I plan on being there, but wanted to make this uh, ahead of time in um, just, uh, due diligence. Um, in the process that my grad studies have taken so far, I had an opportunity to finish this course early because it's all online, and I wanted to avoid a log jam of uh, finals and papers and so forth in the middle of December, or the early part of December. So I'm done a month early, but um, I wouldn't recommend trying that because it was a bit of a t time vampire, but I thought it was the best way to do it. So don't be alarmed that this is being posted a month in advance. Um, it, it's um, just a matter of uh, time management on my part. Um, so as you know, I'm a music educator. Uh, and that's who I am. It's the core of my being. Uh, I've taught other subject areas, but I, I'm really a music educator. Over the last 14 years, I've had a very interesting experience to teaching at a community school in which I was the, uh, I want to say band director. It's not really the right term, but um, and at that school, there was a highly diversified population with most students, an overwhelming majority of students, um, demonstrating high vulnerability markers and um, also very high engagement at the same time in my program anyway. Um, I want to say my program is their program. Anyway, I wanted to put my education proposal, uh, education research proposal in context because it's uh, difficult to understand what it is I'm trying to do if you don't kind of hear and experience what the rationale is based on. So, um, uh, I'm going to sh show you a short video here and give a short anecdote about one of the students um, and uh, then I'll get into the proposal. So in this program, um, uh, I'm not really the director, I'm a facilitator. Uh, every student in the class plays an instrument. This is only half the class, there's another full ensemble that are watching right now. This is a dress rehearsal for a concert that would happen the next day. Um, the students pick the music, and then the students who pick the music lead the ensemble as a band leader or a co-leader or something like that, a collaborator anyway, in running rehearsals. And, um, and then they have three days to get stuff ready to go, um, which is, turns out to be about nine hours worth of time. And uh, then they film a video of it. And then at the end of the quarter, we pick who uh, plays, uh, which songs get played democratically. And... Um, they would play it and shoot videos, sometimes at venues, stuff like that. So anyway, this is like an end of the quarter sort of thing where they're kind of polished and um, they're kind of going through the motions here. Um, I'll play you the first little bit here. Um, usually I'm not in the ensembles and I'm just, I'm, I'm a facilitator again, uh, but a violin player happened to be gone that day, so I filled in. ahead here so you can kind of see how everything gets going. kids just having a blast over there. Um, so in this context, it's amazing that this thing happened at all on this particular day. Um, and I'll tell one anecdote here so you can kind of understand the effect that this has had on uh, young people's lives. Um, uh, I do have consent to uh, share this story with everybody. I've shared it on multiple occasions and they're very open with it. So don't worry about privacy concerns. Um, one of the people in that ensemble that you just saw was in active labor with their third child. And against my advice, they're like, nope, I'm coming in. It's dress rehearsal. We've got the show tomorrow. Um, if I feel I need to go to the hospital, I'll go to the hospital. But um, I've done this two other times before. Don't worry about it. I drank some castor oil. Um, it's, it's, it's fine. I'm coming whether you tell me to or not. Nothing you can do to stop me. I'm not letting the team down. Um, 
So she's in in between takes and and contractions. Um, and if anybody you know who active labor is, it either takes a really long time or a really short time. She knew herself and her biology well enough to go like, this is safe, this is fine. And I, I wasn't about to you know tell an adult what to do or not do with their body. So I, I let it go. And I was like, you know what? If there's a birth that happens in my classroom, that's a blessing. <laughs> so anyway, um, probably a silly risk to take, but it was taken nonetheless. Uh, and um, uh, they actually walked to RUH after this rehearsal, gave birth brought the kid to the concert the next day and um, that kid had their experience seeing their mom being a rock star. Um, if uh, going to a rock band class, you are willing to take that kind of risk and prioritize the, the, the benefit of your uh, um, community and the bandmates over potentially your health and your child's health. Again, maybe silly risk to take, but they took it nonetheless and they were uh, convinced of it. This is one story of hundreds that I could tell you that uh, where I, I see music education making the difference in people's lives and um, it, it's very powerful. It can be very, very powerful. Um, so with that in mind, that's the uh, research, that's the framework behind the rationale. Getting into the proposal now. Um, the title is uh, Making a Case for Pop Music Education in Secondary Schools. Um, within uh, Saskatoon, um, and I have to correct myself because some of my numbers are wrong here, um, I'll have to go back and, and fix that here, but in principle the, the, it's, it's correct, but I have numbers wrong. There are um, uh, six high schools in Saskatoon that uh, have no music education in them whatsoever, and in these schools they generally speaking, have a high population of historically underserved learners. That is to say, um, people living with trauma, disabilities, uh, racialized, um, otherwise uh, uh, learning difficulties, or uh, uh, people that need more support and are due more support from an equity and justice angle. Because of witnessed music education be so powerful and transformative in people's lives, this seems like um, something that's not only unacceptable, it's uh, unethical. And um, I'm doing research to see how viable the kind of ex ex uh, success I've experienced in uh, that one school is portable to others. And my hypothesis is that it is. Um, so the framework here is that um, when we went into COVID times, every music program shifted really rapidly. And then um, they shifted right back to what they were doing before. There's not really a justification for this, uh, or they shifted um, uh, back to what they were doing before, or shifted into nothing, and the programs got cut completely, uh, and they weren't worth, worth bringing back um, and and or fighting for, even though I know that there's people willing to to do it. Um, it to to jump right back into colonial music making after making this big switch where there was student voice and choice all over the place. Uh, it seems like walking backwards to me. And for those other six schools to have nothing to serve these young people um, is uh, um, unacceptable to me. So my uh, hypothesis is, is that pop music education is a viable music education paradigm in three Saskatoon secondary schools that do not offer any music education. That should be four, because the remaining two is a, no, it's another story. But uh, so yeah, there should be four. Um, the literature review, just briefly, uh, I've only been in grad school um, two months now, but I was surprised to see that there is a breadth is not the right word. A plethora is even begins to um, get to it. This is a difficult section to write because I could either pad it with citations or I could just hopefully the reader trusts that it's, it's accurate because there are literally thousands of scholars that have been doing this work before me that I can um, uh, uh, base my research on and stand on those shoulders. Um, I'll, I'll skip the um, um, the jargon here from the music education perspective here, um, but uh, there's justification for this kind of shift to pop music education um, across internationally. internationally. Um, so uh, the literature reviews uh, that I'm uh, uh, trying to illuminate, not just the what kind of music uh, that's viable, but also the how, the for whom, for what purpose. You can't just teach pop music education, everything ma magically works better. Uh, it's a good starting point, but um, the process is what's important. I'm not saying I got that right all the time either. I've definitely made mistakes. <clears throat> the methodology is uh, in five phases. I'm going to go through this real quick. 
mixed method, quantitative gathering, of course, the um, uh, figuring out which schools have no music education program as somebody has been practicing for a long time and I happen to know where they are and it's easy to gather that information. Um, then quantitative data and then qualitative and then putting them all together. So in the quantitative side, I'm going to go into the grade 9 and 10. These are consent forms and I went hard on this. So you don't have to like I needed to do that. Um, um, in the quantitative side, I'm going to go into the grade 9 and 10 classrooms, not the 11s and 12s because they're going to be graduating anyway. They're going to give me results that aren't going to be usable by them. So even if I did measure the grade 11s and 12s, I wouldn't be applying it to them because they're going to graduate anyway. So grade 9s and 10s um, are going to listen to six pieces of music and they're going to respond to two different questions. I'll show you the questions of the music in a second because it's a very purposeful thing to the order of music. Uh, is that they're going to answer, sorry, this is landscapes and a portrait needed to fit. Um, the first question is, how much does this kind of music interest you? And two, would you participate in a music class in your school if this kind of music was taught? Uh, one to five Likert scales closed and uh, five being high, one being low. With a sample size of four schools times about 90 students each school, that's uh, uh, over 300 of a sample size. <clears throat> um, uh, so that the musics I'm playing for them are very purposeful. These are just examples, but the order is important. So number one, something in like the Beatles, it's old enough to be ancient to kids or teenagers. Um, not that all teenagers belong in the same interest group like that. Um, but there's identifiable instruments, a common form, relatively basic harmonic rhythmic structures, that stuff. It's catchy to maintain participant attention. They're going to go, oh, we're listening to this kind of music. Interesting. I'm not just playing the Beethoven or something. Uh, and then immediately switch to something that's a Western European uh, uh, thing, playing like um, water music from Handel or like the national anthem or something that I know people don't seek out to listen to as for uh, uh, for leisure time. Um, I would be hard pressed to believe that any teenager or at least a visible majority of teenagers is going home and listening to the Canadian brass. I just don't think that that's happening. I I'm confident in that statement. <clears throat> now I have the quantitative data to prove it. Uh, three, Traditional Plains Cree powwow drum group and song like Northern Cree has to be a modern high quality recording, like not some voyeuristic sounding like ethnomusical ethnomusicological thing, um, but straight up traditional. Um, uh, four, mid 90s hip hop. Um, something that's before like the gangster rap sort of like commodification of the hip hop genre um, co opted the art form in like the late 90s. Um, something that's uplifting but still has got like it's just stanky and it's good it has to have a female rapper in it because there haven't been much for female like stuff going on before i want to make sure everybody is um as engaged as possible um so anyway the music of rebellion for the sake of uplifting a people without braggadocio that's important so i'm not playing like like if you've ever heard diggable planets you can check them out they are absolute geniuses first um Hip hop Grammy Award winners ever in '91, I believe. <clears throat> um, then mid 1990s to early 2000s, alternative rock uh, like Nirvana or Green Day, Metallica, something like that. Um, music with instruments in it. That's important that it's not just samples or uh, digitally created music. Um, something that is an alternative here would be something like Zombie by Cranberries. For get the a female um, out front sort of situation happening. Either one of those would work, I think. And then a blended rock, hip hop, and traditional Cree, like Hallucination and Electric Pow Wow Drum, which is basically like rap, rock, and traditional Cree Pow Wow song in the same genre. It's like a hybridization. Some of it is attractivism, but this particular group is uh, fantastic. It's a blend of three and five. I want to see how people respond to that. Anyway, for uh, each example, the students are going to know the artist and title, but I'm not going to play any visual cues because video killed the radio star. I want to have an example there. About 90 seconds, you know, a minute to a minute and a half of each one. Uh, I'm not going to prompt or react to the music in any way. I'm just going to play it. That's it. If there's classroom management to be done, the teacher in charge will do that, not me. Um, and then you saw the page here before. I'm going to collect those on paper, not online, and then compile them myself. Or maybe with a research assistant if I get a grant. <laughs> Doubtful. Okay. So um, then I'll talk to the teacher afterwards and see if they find the benefit in this as well. Um, that's quantitative data that I could stick in there with a, um, a conversation or they could do a paper and I could contextualize it by them writing teacher at the top or something so that age. I don't need to get gender because there's no inherent gender in music. I don't need to get age because that could be inferred by grade and personal information is irrelevant and school is only so I can categorize it by which school might prefer which one. 
um, knowing that I know their demographics as you know working in school like that before or just being a member of this community. Um, the qualitative section um, to, is to address not the what kind of music is most preferred even though I think I'm pretty sure I know the answer to those but I might be surprised um, is to address how it would be done to access areas to address barriers to access scope um, ethnographical things um, so I want to talk to at least one stakeholder from every school this could be a principal a vice principal counselor a school coordinator trustee superintendent elder preferably traditional knowledge keeper school community council member anybody who's there to support students or somebody with a lot of corporate knowledge um, that's important and then ask them these questions interviewed about half an hour each what led to the lack of music education in the school can you describe the general health of the student body as in I'm going to try to identify as like this is a community health situation that needs healing or is this a largely functional group that just go ahead and let them they're fine we're on a good path right now that's it or is it this, uh, are these uh, young people struggling in the effects of a highly um, broken public education just in my opinion um, uh, but then what viability or value would music education that focuses on student voice and choice have in the school community referring to question one might barriers might exist to implementing this type of programming in the school community in the future predicted answer budget human resources facility um, student interest this sort of thing things to consider whether there's a viability option here and five um, uh, uh, this is particularly directed at culture bearers if I'm talking to one but it might help anybody with corporate knowledge uh, it has been noted that pop music education does not automatically foster equitable outcomes how would you like to see culture bearers integrated into pop music education delivery format in the school community in other context of this the um, students then will also have a conversation with me after the survey is done that I can what I want to do this afterwards so it doesn't inform the, the quantitative data collection where I, I tell them what's possible so I think a lot of people think that there's um, curricular rules around the kind of music that you're supposed to be able to learn in schools and it's just not true and even if it were true there's no curriculum police um, I was doing this rock band program for 14 years and, and it's it was fine in fact welcome to have that kind of shift where the students saw their reflections and their cultures uh, in in the music that they were playing because they chose what it was so after this thing what's kind of music do you want to uh, play it's, it's like well you're gonna to want to play whatever it is that you want to play and there's many different answers there are people but uh, I don't want that to uh, frame their response to the surveys so if I after this say like did you know it was possible to do this I can kind of see in the room by reading the energy is there actually an interest here it's like would you like to do this in your school would this be something that's interested is interesting to you and if I can identify like four people per class that kind of like have an enthusiastic response to that that's times three classes um, of grade nines or grade tens or both that's um, 12 people and maybe those 12 people will bring you know 12 more and that's a lot for a, a small ensemble class and that's enough to make it viable it's, I'd have to be able to read the room though um, yeah so in those choices of music if there's a cultural element being brought forth um, it needs to be addressed that the method of d doing things like trauma-informed or um, uh, historically informed um, and uh, uh, how to uh, make not necessarily an authentic experience in, in the cultural music but a respectful uh, integration of something through me as a settler teacher uh, is can only be done with a certain amount of scope and I want to make sure that's gotten right plus it can inform teacher education make these programs happen in the first place uh, and then interpreting this I just kind of did this it's like analysis by a professional music educator that has experience could be uh, a lot of people I know lots of people interested in this stuff and I wouldn't be um, scant for um, finding professionals to interpret this data uh, pop music education again the hypothesis is a viable music education paradigm in three Saskatoon secondary schools that do not offer any music education here's my reference list and this is a really short one because the level of reading that you know supports this kind of thing is overwhelming <clears throat> okay um, that's it that's my presentation questions comments concerns cries for help etc sorry get my teacher hat on here for a second um, um, yeah this was a great class I was really uh, thankful for the opportunity to build towards thesis writing I'm a lot less scared of it now and uh, yeah thanks to everybody for um, uh, listening and for your support throughout the thing I'll see you on the front lines later on